worship together this morning.
and welcome uh, to the House of Stone, St. John Congregation. Hey, my name is Brett. This is Katie. You just let us. And uh, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, we are continuing through Matthew. Uh, hey, we're, if you've been with us, we've been in Matthew for a very long time. We've seen the Matthew like, like design thing for a very long time. And, uh, and I realized this week, we're in like chapter 21, 22. There's only 26. So we're getting close, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but man, we're continuing through and there's a very uh, good word today uh, about Jesus being our cornerstone. And, uh, and what's crazy is Ross is gonna say this, but they will have just been singing, people who, who Jesus is talking to will have just been singing a few days before uh, Psalm 118. And so we're gonna read just a few sections of Psalm 118 to call us to worship today. Uh, just, just a few sections, okay? So this is, um, this is so good, okay? It'll be on the screen for you to follow along. Just let me read this over you. And we're, gonna, we're just gonna respond to this. This is the Word of God. The Word of God says about itself that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's living and it's active. So we're just gonna trust it, okay? We're just gonna trust, I'm gonna read this. And we're just gonna trust that God will use His Word. To, to stir up worship in us today. Because we were just praying in the green room that none of us are able to do it. No preacher, no worship leader, no musician is able to stir up worship in us today. It's not gonna happen just through a song. What we need is the Spirit of God, the living Spirit of God to actually stir it up in us. So let me just read this. Let's read the words of God and let God call us to worship, okay? I hear it, Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. That's for you today, walking in this room. It doesn't matter what you've been walking through. It doesn't matter how you've sinned in the last few days, since the last time we were together. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter the suffering you're going through right now. It doesn't matter if you think you've got it all together. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Receive it today. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Because it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. That's what we're doing today. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. A few verses down, it says this, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. And here's the lyrics to the songs of, of salvation, right? The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. So open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me, God, that you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice. Let's have joy and be glad in it. And then he ends with this. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So let's just make this our prayer. This is that last, that last section. Is it still up there? Jordan, if you can, or actually Lindsay, my wife back there, if you can uh, put up those last two verses. And let's just, let's make this our prayer together. Even hold your hands out. And let's read this together. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let's sing. the 
praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you.
gift that is, God, that we get to do that, that we get to build our lives on you, Lord, when we offer you nothing. Like we talked about earlier, we come with empty hands, God. We come here to just praise you, worship you, hear your word, God, to learn even more of the character of you, the one who came to save us. God, your word is so good. It is true. It has promises that are fulfilled and that will be fulfilled. And so Lord, I ask for anyone in this room, anyone in this city, anyone on this earth, God, that I ask if they are building their lives on anything other than you right now, God, I ask that you would change their hearts. Help them to chase after you like you're chasing after us. Help them to feel you, God. Help them to know that you are close. Help me to know that, God. Lord, we need you. We're here for you this morning. And we ask that you would do crazy, miraculous things in hearts this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Alrighty, good morning church. It's very good to be with you again. Matthew 21, 33 is where we're gonna be. And so if you have your Bibles, that's the best place for you to turn. Uh, here is the context. It's the last week of the life of Jesus. And so Matthew spends 20 chapters, right, on, 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 the, on three years really of ministry in Jesus' life. And then he spends seven and a half chapters on seven days, the seven days that Jesus spends in Jerusalem as he prepares for his death. And where we, where we dive in, Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. It's a great song and dance, right? There's been a huge celebration. It's in the middle of an important feast season. The Passover is about to kick off, but Jesus wasn't in the mood for feasting. And so while people celebrate his arrival, he arrives with a tone of stern judgment over his beloved city, Jerusalem. He pronounces judgment again and again on the city and on the leaders that lead the religion that comes from that city. This is the theme of this section for sure. And so if you're with us for a few weeks, we're gonna go like, Jesus is judging quite a lot of things. Yes, it's the theme by design, by the power of the Spirit to remind us and to awaken us from our slumber. Before he goes to his death, Jesus is calling sinners to himself and he's saying, beware lest the judgment of the Lord come upon this place and upon you people. So Jesus teaches a variety of parables and they're parables of judgment. Now we've made parables kind of ootsy kootsy, right? We've made them like, are oh, they earthly stories with a heavenly meaning? And that's true, right? But they're not cute. They're very gritty. They're very earthy. And in this case, they're very judgy, right? Jesus is saying, I'm giving you an opportunity to turn back to righteousness. So let me tell you some stories about it. And he's enacted one of these parables by destroying a fig tree and saying, Israel is like this fig tree. It's not bearing any fruit. And so it will be judged. It will be destroyed. And of course, this comes to be not many years after this when the temple is ransacked and ruined and knocked down and the people of Israel are left perplexed in that scenario. What happens though is when Jesus does this, he walks into town, he pronounces judgment, he turns over tables in the temple, he kills fig trees. The religious leaders of the day are offended, right? Because he's talking to them and about them and they basically ask him, who do you think you are? By what authority do you think you can do these things? By what authority do you think you can judge us? We're representing God. Who gives you the right to come into our place and act like this? And in response to that, who gives you authority? Jesus goes, let me tell you dumb, dumb some stories, right? Let me tell you who I am. Let me center this whole thing in the redemptive history that you have clearly Missed. And so the parable we read today is one of those stories that he tells in response to that question. Well, who do you think you are, Jesus? You can't tell us what to do. Well, this story outlines very clearly who he is and why he dares to claim that he can stand in judgment over them. It's the parable of the tenants and the owner of the vineyard. And the gist is Jesus is gonna say, you wanna know who I think I am? I'm the son of the owner. And you know who you are? 
you're the tenants and you're unfaithful tenants. And the owner is sending messenger after messenger to come and warn you. And now the son is here. That's who I think I am. You guys think you're owners of this deal. You're tenants and you're unfaithful ones. Now there's a difference between tenants and owners. We discovered this, right, even in our society, which is very different to this one. Um, but in our society, when we moved to Austin three and a half years ago, we thought back then, this is going to tickle you, right? We thought back then that the property market was bananas, right? We thought it was insane. So we thought houses were way too expensive. So we sold a nice house in Johannesburg and brought our money across. But because of conversion rates and because it's 15 rand to $1, we had enough to buy like a Happy Meal, right? And so we arrived and we were like, well, how on earth are we going to buy a house? It's like, well, you can't. And so what did we do? We signed a lease agreement. We agreed to be tenants in a house that someone else owned. Now, having lived in a house that I owned, this was uncomfortable for me for a while because our landlord kept making it very clear to us that he was the owner and we were the tenant and those relationships are based on that power dynamic. It's different. There's different sets of responsibilities and there's different sets of power. And so I said, hey, can I cut down this tree? No. Why? You're the tenant, right? I'm the owner. I decide which trees are here and which trees are not. It's like, oh, that's a dumb tree. Can it go? No, it can't. Hey, can I bring in a trampoline? No. Why? You're the tenant. I'm the owner, right? And if your kids fall off, which they inevitably will because trampolines were uh, uh, developed by chiropractors and orthopedic surgeons, right? It was a, a joint summit that they got together and invented this device. How will we keep our businesses going? I have an idea, right? And so he didn't want the liability of that. And so, no, you can't, right? And, and this started to great. Can I paint this wall? No. Why? You're a tenant and I'm the owner. I get it, I get it, I get it, right? I did enjoy it though when the property tax bill arrived. And I said, guess what? I'm just a tenant, <laughs> you're the owner. This one is for you and my goodness, it's a big number, right? I don't know how you're gonna pay this. And when the water heater broke, I was like, I'm just the tenant, right? <laughs> Call the owner, come and fix this thing. There's a difference between being a tenant and being an owner and Jesus wants to point that out in this parable. Let me just say this before I get into it and we're gonna walk through it really quickly. This parable is not hard to understand. Some of them are, right? You read some parables, you go like, what on earth does that mean? This one isn't, right? Some parables are for teaching. Some parables are for telling. This parable is just for telling. Jesus is just saying it how it is. And it's clearly understood even by those who first hear it. So just know this. Firstly, it was spoken to a, a specific group of people. I've spoken to the religious leaders of the day. That doesn't mean we can dial out because we're, we're going to discover that we are like them, right? And so it's got two horizons of meaning. It still teaches us today, even though it was spoken to them. But it is an historical record, this parable, of all of redemptive history. You might say it is a summation of all of Scripture, in a way, in the telling of one story. And so it's going to be hugely applicable for us. Let's walk through it, and then we'll come back and examine some of what it tells us today, verse 33. It says, listen to another parable. This is Jesus speaking, right? Remember, in response to they said, under whose authority do you do these things? Under whose authority do you say this? He goes, let me tell you another story. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. He leased it to the tenant farmers and went away. Now, when we read this, we think it's just a random story, but it's such a brilliant and beautiful setup from Jesus because he's speaking to religious leaders who, remember, have memorized most of the Old Testament, and this sounds exactly like the introduction to an Old Testament prophetic message that his hearers would have known from Isaiah 5. It describes the people of Israel as a vineyard that God has planted and fenced and watched over and put a wine press in the midst of it. In Isaiah though, God arrives and finds rotten fruit growing in that vineyard. And so he tears down its walls and lets it become overrun, right? In the prophetic foreshadowing of what Babylon was gonna do to Israel, right? This similarity highlights the difference though, because suddenly the story takes a sideways turn. So instead of God then saying, okay, well, I'll remove the wine press, I remove the barriers, I remove the watchtower, you guys are on your own. No, no, tenants are introduced in this story, which is totally different. They were people who didn't own the land, but who worked it for a share of the crop. Now, this is the brilliant setup that targets the religious leaders. What is the big story, the big message, the big setup of the parable so far? God owns the vineyard, Israel is the vineyard, the religious leaders are tenants. 
of the vineyard. They're stewards. They're responsible for it, but they don't own it, right? You're supposed to look after the place and to ensure that it grows good fruit. You're not supposed to trash it, but you're also not supposed to pretend you own it. Being a tenant in that system means that you had low power and high responsibility. (laughs) Jesus is saying, that's you guys. You're supposed to be low on power, high on responsibility. You've made yourself high on power, very low on responsibility, and you're not faithfully stewarding the vineyard of God. Verse 34, when the time came to harvest fruit, he sent his servants to the farmers to collect his fruit. So this is how payment would be gained for the landowner. The farmers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. What a hostile, violent, over-the-top response. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first group, and they did the same to them. (laughs) Now again, this is language they would have understood, because what is Jesus doing here? He's moving on to the next phase of the Old Testament. This is the obvious treatment that the people had extended to the prophets through the ages. God had sent prophets to warn Israel to bear fruit, and they would beat them, and they would stone them, and they would kill them. This had extended across generations and it worked all the way up to John the Baptist, whose call to repentance they had also rejected. And so what does the landowner do next? Verse 37, finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. And so they seized him, they threw him out the vineyard and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these farmers? Now Jesus is our wonderful teacher, what does he do? He invites engagement, he invites feedback, and he invites people to speak pronouncements and judgments over themselves. He's like, okay, so I won't judge you, you judge yourself. What's the, what's the owner of the vineyard gonna do to these people? And they say, I imagine, through gritted teeth and mumbling, he will completely destroy these terrible men, those terrible men, they told him, and lease his vineyard to other farmers who will give him his fruit at the harvest. And this happens, friends. It's the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem as its center to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth so that we are recipients of it in Austin, Texas today, taken from the original stewards of the vineyard and placed into other hands. But the call is the same, be faithful. Now listen, often when people critique or review or assess my preaching, one of the things they say is, man, you're funny, right? And it's a coping mechanism for me, to be honest, because I find the world tragically funny. And so if I didn't laugh, I would cry. But now I'm gonna walk us through five principles and I don't think we're gonna laugh once. Is that okay? So let's lower the expectations. I found that lowered expectations are the key to happiness um, in life because then everything is kind of awesome, right? Because I wasn't expecting much and it was okay, so I'm happy. If you think everything's gonna be awesome, then life is miserable, okay? So listen, American friends, not everything is awesome all the time. Most things are, eh, all right? And if you go in expecting that, then you'll be, Hugely surprised and overjoyed, okay? This is gonna be some hard work because I said, I think this parable tells the whole of redemptive history and I wanna anchor us in it today. And so let's pay attention to what the Lord is saying to us today. Here's some broad principles that I think applied specifically to these religious leaders, but I think have an horizon of meaning for us to walk in today. First one is this, God, is generous in the blessing of his people. God is generous in the blessing of his people. The image of the landowner is of one who sets the vineyard and its workers up for success. He is generous and gracious and kind. He doesn't expect or require good fruit from a poorly kept or poorly equipped piece of land. God is not this cruel taskmaster in the story and he's not this cruel taskmaster in all of divine revelation. We're told that he is kind and compassionate and that he blesses us. He puts a 
fence of protection around Israel. He, he puts a wine press right there so that they don't have to transport crops to another place. He builds a watchtower so that it can be protected from attack. And he gives them real and meaningful work and a role in the production of good fruit. It's like a retelling of Eden again, right? Everything is good and you're protected and you have my presence and you have real work to do. Subdue the earth, right? Steward this faithfully. Our God is kind to his people. He's done the same thing in your life. He has set parameters and boundaries and he has blessed you abundantly so that you might steward his favor as a tenant of his blessing, a tenant in your own life. Jesus was reminding the religious leaders that God has been kind to his people, Israel. And as a result, they really ought to be humbly bearing fruit He had brought them out of slavery. He had cleared the land before them. He had given them peace and prosperity on all sides. And yet, and yet, and yet, what did they want? More and other. They didn't want to submit to his rule and reign, and so they rebelled. He sets them up for success, and they had turned away from him in what? Dissatisfaction. What's the story of the Old Testament? The people get brought out of slavery, and what do they spend the rest of their civilization doing? Looking back, saying, wasn't Egypt better? (laughs) dissatisfied at what God had given them. And friends, listen, before we go, ah, silly Israel, this is our story. This is the root of so much of our sin. We forget the kindness of God and we become convinced that he is holding out on us when he has provided for us already so mercifully. Think about it with me just for a second. Where are you tempted to sin? So many of our temptations lie in areas where we think that God has been holding out on us, that there's more available for us and that he put a barrier there because he doesn't want our joy, he wants to deprive us of happiness. We believe that he hasn't given us enough to satisfy us in certain areas and so we have to go to our own places to satisfy us because we think we know better. But friends, that isn't true. How much joy and contentment could be found, listen, in stopping to recount all of God's wonderful deeds? Perhaps our complaining and our sinful discontent directly parallels with our lack of recounting God's faithfulness. Love the Psalms. There's a Psalm for every occasion. One of the themes of the Psalms is thanksgiving. (laughs) It's stopping and remembering that regardless of what we are going through, God has been merciful to us. I love Psalm 9. The first verse says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount of all of his wonderful deeds. My friends, God is generous in the blessing of his people that continues today. Second one. Not only is he generous, but God is patient and persistent with his people. Look at the story. He sends so many servants. He sends so many messengers. First one, beaten. Second one, killed. Third one, stoned. What does he do? He sends more. And this is the pattern um, of the people of God. God sent to them prophet after prophet and servant after servant, and they don't listen to any of them. In fact, what do they do? They brutalized them. You know, it was super risky to be a prophet of the Lord. I see self-appointed, self-titled prophets today, and I'm like, you don't know what you're signing up for. If you do your job right, they will cut you in half. And yet I see your bank account details at the bottom of the screen. This seems to be the reward for a modern day prophet. What happened to the prophets of of old? Jeremiah, beaten, not once, but on multiple occasions. Every time he preached, he didn't get negative sermon feedback. He got beaten up. He was thrown into a pit, ultimately stoned by an angry mob. Uriah, killed with a sword. Micaiah, punched in the face. Have you ever been punched in the face? It's not nice. It's not nice. Elijah and Amos are driven into exile to live in caves. Ezekiel murdered after a sermon. It's like, I'm just telling you what God said. They're like, you gotta die. Habakkuk, Zechariah, both stoned to death. Isaiah cut in half. 
the faithful servant of God. And yet what does God keep doing? He sends and he sends and he seeks and he seeks and he calls and he calls. And friends, again, before we get all self-righteous, you go like, well, I haven't cut anyone in half. Sure, I said some stuff over the Sunday lunch table about last week's sermon that wasn't all that kind, but I haven't brutalized anyone in this way. How patient has God been with us though? With you, with me, it's unbelievable. He sent messengers, he sent pastors, he sent friends, he sent family to rebuke us and to bring us back. He breathed his word that we would read, so that we would discover where we are wrong, so that we would return. And what do we do? We reject it again and again and again and again until we find the parts that agree with us. And what does he do? He sends again and he calls again. And he seeks again. He is so patient with us, it's unbelievable. He warns, he scolds, he rebukes, he refines, he prunes, he calls, he reminds so many times. He is so patient. Just this last week, I tried really, really hard to be mad at someone when their sin was revealed. I tried to be mad. I was ready to go into full self-righteous outrage mode. You know that mode you discover something, you're like, how could they, right? But I couldn't. Why? I remembered Romans 2, which says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? It's his kindness It's his patience, it's his forbearance that brings us back to himself. So how dare we be unkind and impatient and refuse to bear with those who sin when God doesn't do that to us? Friends, listen, God is patient with you so that you will be repentant. Jesus was reminding the religious leaders of Israel that they had missed that. They had abused his kind and They had abused his kind call back to himself and they had said no. They had shunned and killed the messengers who were inviting them into a wonderful homecoming of repentance. Don't do the same with the spirit today. Third one, man sins in an insane attempt to thwart God's ownership. They might go insane, that's a strong word, Ross, but I mean it. Does anyone else find the response for the tenants here insane? Imagine my landlord, hey, it's time for your monthly rent. No, it's time for you to die, right? And then just walking back inside going, well, that took care of that. Then he sends someone else. I'm like, and it's time for you to die too, right? That's like a Kill Bill movie. It's, it's, it's insane. Did they really think this strategy was gonna work? Like the owner wouldn't notice that his messengers either weren't coming back or were coming back badly injured. What happened to you? Oh, no big deal. You're missing an arm. Like, yeah, that's fine. But this is sin, friends. This is how blind sin is. And this is what motivates it. You see, the tenants were not content to be tenants. They wanted to be the owners and they became blinded by that desire for power, that desire for so-called freedom. And that drive led them to acts that they hoped would bring them the sense of freedom and liberation, even though they knew it would bring them their own destruction and they did it anyway. Sin is this sort of insanity. (laughs) It blinds us to consequences and it erases our memory. Have you noticed this? Sin erases your memory to the hundreds of times that it hasn't worked before. And it convinces us afresh again and again that the problem is the landowner and that our liberation lies in his overthrow. This is the essence of all sin. Did God really say, surely you will not die? The problem is this landowner. If you would just find and taste for yourself, oh, you would taste such freedom and then you try and you don't taste freedom. And then what happens? You forget and you try again (laughs) and then you forget and then you try again. It's insanity. I am not a tenant. I'm an owner. My life is my own and I can do with it what I like. That's my freedom. But what do the scriptures tell us? You are not your own. (laughs) You were bought with a price. And that's Paul writing in the context of a call to holiness. You don't get to do what you want. You do what the owner wants, right? Why? You're not your own. 
You're a tenant even of your own life. It's sin whispers. Oh, you're not free that way. Self-determination is the way to freedom. Don't be a tenant. Fourth one. In response to man's sin, what does God do? He sends his son. Oh, it's magnificent. This is the part of the story that would have drawn audible gasps, right? People were going, what? No one would do that. The landowner would send troops, not his son, but God does what man would never do. He sends his son into the arms of the rebellious ones he knows will kill him. Friends, this is a powerful moment in redemptive history. Because remember, what's the question they've asked Jesus? Who do you think you are? Who's authority, right? (laughs) This is Jesus telling the religious leaders where they were in redemptive history. Hey, guess what? God's taking the vineyard from you and he's giving it to a new people. And guess what? Here's who I am in the midst of God's redemptive plan. I am the son of the landowner. He's also telling them, and guess what you're gonna do to me? Not many days from now. I've arrived and I've pronounced there's no good fruit. You're gonna put me to death while I'm reaching out to save you. Friends, oh my goodness. This is our God. In response to our worst, he gives his best. (laughs) In response to our sin, he sends his son to love us and to save us and to rescue us. And they killed him. Okay, at this point it shifts, right? So Jesus had asked the leaders what should be done to the tenants that agreed that those men deserve to die. But look at the grace and the mercy of our King Jesus. He teaches them plainly what sort of danger they're in and he gives them one more opportunity to turn. Now listen, I was an English teacher. This is a mixed metaphor, as bad as any mixed metaphor I've ever seen, right? But far be it from me to grade the creative writing skills of the Holy Spirit. And so there must be a reason that we switch metaphors here. And what it is, is it's actually tying all of redemptive history together. It goes from this narrative of a vineyard, landowner, tenants, to this altar. It goes from Isaiah 5 to Isaiah 8, right? To speaking about this cornerstone of the temple. Where is Jesus teaching this lesson? In the temple. I imagine he looks around as he says this. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? This is beautiful. I imagine he smiles, Peter chuckles, right? Because this is a smackdown (laughs) to a religious leader done in love. Why? They have not only read the scriptures, they have memorized them. And yet Jesus is saying, you've wasted it. Haven't you read? Haven't you read? Did you miss the part? You guys were singing Psalm 118 a couple of days ago. That one's about me, right? Read the rest of the psalm, right? He he quotes now Psalm 118, which is part of the Psalms of Hallel, which were the Psalms of praise used for the feast of the Passover, right? And so this song was ringing in everyone's ears. Everywhere they went in those few days, people would have been singing Psalm 118. It was like every church you went to sung Oceans a while ago, right? It was like, it was like the big hit of the day um, and a big hit in the season of Passover. And in fact, they had sung some lines from it as Jesus had entered on a humble donkey. They had sung the lines, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Where's it from? Psalm 118. Jesus said, Keep reading. Have you not read? That Psalm is about God's kindness in building the temple for people to experience his presence. Remember then that it goes on to say, hey, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And this is what the Lord has done. And it is wonderful in our eyes. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm not just the son of the landowner, I'm the cornerstone of the temple. It's me. I'm here. Now, friends, what is a cornerstone? I know most of us aren't architects. I certainly am not, right? I've been building a deck with some friends in my backyard. It was a two-weekend project. It has taken six months, right? And most of that is because I go like, 
What are we doing? I've got no idea what we're doing. I don't understand what comes next, what, what happens next, right? But I've been doing some research on this cornerstone idea. The cornerstone was the most important part of a foundational structure. Builders would agonize over its selection because if you got it wrong, nothing else would stand. Nothing would endure even the slightest tremble of the earth. You could build as beautifully and as intricately as you liked, but the building was only as strong as the stone that it was built upon. And so Psalm 118 is written in preparation for the temple being rebuilt, and it celebrates, hey, they've chosen a stone to be the center point of its structure, but it warns, hey, the thing that you think is gonna give the temple its strength, the thing that you think will help it to endure and last, the thing that you think will hold it all together, it's not the thing. They chose a stone that looked beautiful and strong and perfect. And yet here they were rejecting the one that didn't look like any of those things, but who was the ultimate cornerstone. They were looking to one who was strong and beautiful and prominent. And they overlooked the man of sorrows who was meek and humble and holy and a peacemaker and a friend of sinners, the cornerstone. And what's the result of their rejection? Look what Jesus says, just listen. All right, I've just got to trust the spirit that he can make this real to you. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. Imagine hearing this religiously that you've given your whole life to this. It will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. That's how you know the kingdom's at hand. People produce fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will shatter him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them. Although they were looking for a way to arrest him, they feared the crowds because the people regarded him as a prophet. They've got their chance to repent and they miss it. Why? They love power more than they love their savior. It's the last observation is this. God has chosen a cornerstone for us to build our lives upon. Goodness me, friends, God in his grace had said messenger after messenger, but now in these last days, the scriptures tell us, he has sent his son and his son is the cornerstone of God's redemptive plan in the world. As a result, the keys to the kingdom of God were taken from the covenant people of Israel and given to those around the globe who make up the kingdom of God and who build their lives on the cornerstone of Christ. Listen now, I fear there is a difference to being in Christendom or being in cultural Christianity, perhaps even between calling yourself a Christian and building your life on the cornerstone of Christ. Whoever now stumbles over Christ is broken to pieces and whoever won't acknowledge him will ultimately be cracked by the reality of his lordship. I don't say that lightly, but I say that in accordance with the scriptures. And friends, we know this happened. The beautiful temple that Jesus was standing in was destroyed and defiled. The stones they had put all of their trust in were toppled over. The cornerstone they had chosen couldn't hold it all together. Oh, what a tragedy for them. But friends, please, I know you're like, Ross, it's summer. Aren't we supposed to just have like chilled sermons, right? Life's intense enough. I didn't choose the text, right? We don't get to rest on our laurels because I still think that some of us might stumble over the cornerstone and find our lives in pieces when we do. Here are three ways as I close that I think that some, even those who claim the name of Christ, continue to stumble over him as the cornerstone. The first one is by rejecting Christ's word, by rejecting his word. Look at what Peter said. Peter was standing here, right, when Jesus said this. And I imagine years later, he's reflecting on this moment as he writes to the church and tells them, you are a royal priesthood, right? It's been taken from the priesthood. Now you are a royal priesthood. It's been taken from a nation. Now you are a holy nation, 
right? A, a, a people who belongs to God. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's chosen people, right? And then he goes on to say, and to quote again, Psalm 118, he says, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone, First Peter 2 verse seven. And it's a stone to stumble over. It's a rock to trip over. People aren't looking where they're going and they stumble over Christ. They stumble, why, Peter says, because they disobey the word, and they were destined for this. Peter says, a sure way to stumble over Christ is to disobey the word, to forget that you are a tenant, and to think that you are the owner of your life who gets to determine the rules of the game. How do you know you're doing this? A couple of ways. You're selective in your application of Christ's teaching. Why are we so familiar with the teachings of Christ and yet our lives look so far removed from the teachings of Christ? Because we're selective. Why is it that so many of us claim to know Christ and so few of us are anything like him? I say this not to our shame, I say, Lord, help us. And I include myself in the number. And for many of us, listen, friends, in this cultural moment, please listen carefully. I'm serving you humbly, I believe, this morning. And if not, the Spirit will correct me. But for some of us, it's gone beyond even the fact that we failed to live out Christ's teaching. It's like we don't even see it as good anymore. The Sermon on the Mount doesn't seem like the right way to live to us anymore. <laughs> Christ's people don't want to live Christ's way. The meek, nah. The peacemakers, nah, doormats. The persecuted, I don't want to be persecuted. That will be the end of my hope. And yet Jesus says these are the blessed people in his kingdom. Some of us have allowed our morality and our ethic to be shaped by our surroundings more than shaped by the word. Now you feel like you're with me, you're like, yeah, tell them, pastor. I see the problem, I see the problem. But I wanna say to you, friends, I think that it's those with both progressive and conservative leanings who seem to allow their lives to be shaped more by progressive or conservative ethics than by the timeless word of God. And no, your ethic and the timeless word of God is not the same thing. <laughs> it will correct us regardless of which way we lean. <laughs> it just will all the time because it's another thing. Okay, second way we can stumble. I warned you, okay? <laughs> By relying on ourselves is the second way. By relying on ourselves. Paul says that there is no other way, uh, there is another way to stumble over the cornerstone that is Christ, and that is relying on yourselves to accomplish peace with God. Look at what Paul warns in Romans 9. He says, but Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, look, I'm putting a, a stone in Zion to stumble over, and a rock to trip over, and the one who believes on him. Oh, this is great will not be put to shame. Paul says that Israel stumbled, why? Because they believed that right standing with God was based on works and not on faith. And yet friends, our hearts are prone to the same thing. How do you know you're doing this? Well, firstly, your desire is to hide sin rather than to confess it. <laughs> if you wanna hide your sin rather than bring it into the light, you're living in a works-based righteousness. You think that your sin hidden will protect you when in fact repentance in the light is your only hope. <laughs> People who believe the gospel repent a lot and publicly. Why? They care about righteousness more than they care about their reputation. And they believe the gospel. They believe the scandal that every time they do it, they're fully restored, fully forgiven. 
Another way that you know you might be doing this, you're stumbling over the stone that is Christ, is that your certainty of God's love waxes and wanes with your own performance. That's an evidence of works-based righteousness. You think, when I do well, God is so stoked, and he loves me so much. And when I do badly, he's miserable with me and kind of loathes me and just tolerates me. Anyone feel this? A spiritual temperature does this based on our own performance. No, 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 friends. Our spiritual temperature should be based on the performance of Christ. And you know what he is? Always perfect and always enough, which means we can always have joy because we're always in good standing if we're his. Okay, third one. So you can stumble by rejecting Christ's word. You can stumble by relying on yourself. Last one, I'll get out your hair. I know it's been a lot. You can stumble by replacing the cornerstone with something else, with something else. Guys, I come to you gently this morning. Does anyone else feel the uncertainty and the anxiety of our times though? It's like our very zeitgeist at the moment is an anxious age. It's a thing, right? We feel like the rug of of certainty is being pulled out from underneath us. In these moments then, Who do you go to and what do you turn to for certainty and comfort and joy and hope? Being a pastor those last 18 months has been difficult, but it's been wonderful because I've seen God prune us and me, oh, so much. I'm like a bare little sapling, right? He's cut away the rest. And I see him doing it in the church and I'm really excited and hopeful about the future of God's people but we must pay attention to the purifying effect going on. And what is being revealed is that many of us have many other things besides Christ as the cornerstone of our lives. Important things, sure. Things to be passionate about, sure. Cornerstones, no. In tumultuous times, when it feels unsteady all around you, I have some breaking news for you. Your political party will not hold your will together for you. Your news channel will not hold your will together for you. Your shrinking circle of like-mindedness will not hold your will together for you. Your particular philosophy on how society should be run will not hold your will together for you. Your wealth cannot hold your will together for you. Your acclaim, your fame, your recognition, your acceptance will not hold your world together for you. It is Christ and Christ alone and none beside him and none before him. That's our hope. We belong to Christ, the cornerstone. I said at the beginning that this parable in a way tells the story of the whole world in a nutshell. Let's remember it. God is so generous in blessing us as his people. He's been patient, oh so patient, and so persistent in the winning of his people back to himself. We sin continually in an insane, repeated attempt to overthrow God. And in response, what does he do? He sends his son to die for us, but then also to set him as the cornerstone of our lives. And my dear beloved friends, and I mean that, love this church, love you people, but building on anything or anyone other than Christ as the cornerstone will result in a great stumbling. Let us be faithful tenants of our own lives. Let us respond to this great vineyard owner who sent his son. Let us set our lives afresh this morning on him and on nothing else. Father God, thank you for your word. I pray that you use it today as a healing balm. Sometimes that means you've got to cut away some things that have started to grow, and I pray that you do that. And then I pray that you restore us. Remind us this morning, oh, Christ is the cornerstone. That's not just a rebuke. That's a marvelous invitation. I get to build on him. Oh, thank God. My righteousness is dependent on him. Oh, thank God. 
My life is found steady and stable in the midst of a great shaking because of him. Oh, thank God. Forgive me, Lord, for the thousands of other things I've built upon. Do something in your church. Revive us. Awaken us. Help us to turn from our folly lest we be found to be unfaithful tenants. We don't want that to be the case. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your kindness, your patience. May your patience lead to great repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He would give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure Let's not move past that today. It's the heart of the parable. That he would send his son. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his own. To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing love The Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory I sit upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice, call out among the scoffers, we confess, it was my sin that held him until
all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Yes, this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom judgment, the cornerstone falls on you when you're shattered. And what we're about to sing again is that he will come with trumpet sound. He will come as a righteous judge. 
but oh, would we be the people who have thrown ourselves onto the cornerstone and just been shattered? Would we be the ones who lose our lives that we may find it? Would we be the ones who, who trust in him now? And then we'll stand faultless before him. Here it is. When he shall call with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless, faultless to stand before the throne. Are you seeing Christ alone? Christ alone. church family. Hey, you guys can have a seat for just a second. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Ryan. I'm the director of our middle school and high school student ministries here at St. John. And I have some important things to tell you this morning that you need to know about. So man, first and foremost, we know that the church is not meant to be just an event we attend, but a family that we participate in. And if that's not your experience yet this morning, we wanna help make that happen. Out in the lobby right here, there is a sign with a big QR code on it. You can scan that and tell us all your information. We wanna get you connected to community here, to ways to use your spiritual gifts here to serve in our church family, uh, to connect you with Bible studies coming up. But we want that to be your experience. This is your church family. We want you to help you find your place in it. Uh, Also, uh, right after service this morning, our elders, our staff will be right up front here. We want to meet you. We want to connect with you, learn your name, hear your story, pray for you. If there's anything we can pray for you, we'll be up here and we would be honored to meet you and to do that with you. So please come connect this morning with us up front. Uh, Also, man, this morning, just hearing Ross open a parable for us that took us through all of redemptive history. Like that was incredible to see a parable just open that window again. And and my prayer for you, my hope for you is that the love of God, uh, the the patience of God towards us, the generosity of God was just made new to us again this morning. And we respond to that generosity, to that patience of God with generosity ourselves in our giving and our offerings. So if you've been looking for a way to support the ministry of the Austin Stone, to support your church family here, we have an offering box right out in the lobby, a physical box there that you can give. Also on our app and on our website, there's easy ways there to give and support all the things that are happening through your church family. I just want to point you towards that. It's just a way to respond to everything again that we heard this morning. A quick reminder, if you are going to the partnership class happening at 11 o'clock, that's going to be out in our Ridgetop room, which is right through these doors, through the lobby, and then off to the left towards the nursery. There's a big meeting room there. You can meet us there if you're part of the partnership class. Again, come talk to us this morning. Our elders and our staff will be up here. We'd love to pray for you, love to meet you. But let's stand again as we hear our benediction this morning. Hold your hands out in front of you. 
let's read this out loud together, all right? Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. Peace.